first of all, thank you to EDRI and all of the organizers for having me here. This is really quite an honor, so thank you so much. Um, I'm here on behalf of Spring Archive. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have heard of Spring Archive before, but for those who haven't, um, we were founded 2014, so now about six years ago. Um, and uh, coming mostly from the privacy and digital security scenes. Um, so the couple of founders uh, were working on, on doing um, uh, privacy digital security trainings, organizational security trainings, and, 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 and things like this. Um, so we're really connected to this community quite a lot, and it's exciting to be here and to be part of this. Um, maybe maybe um, before I go into what I'm doing and, and how we um, work with technology, it makes sense to first talk about um, how conflicts have always been understood um, through emerging technology, right? So since you mentioned photography, um, uh, the first use case being the American Civil War, um, emerging tech has been a way of witnessing or documenting conflicts, right? Um, and we saw that this has grown with um, the war in Vietnam. Uh, we're seeing that film is the first um, um, conflict that's being documented, or Vietnam is the first conflict that's being filmed um, on a wide scale. Um, so with the Vietnam War, journalists for the first time were offered unrestricted access, right? They could go places uh, that previously they weren't able to go. Um, historically, conflicts have been understood through um, uh, journalists from established media groups or through governments themselves, right? But Vietnam offered the first chance to, to see that these um, other stories um, of, of understanding the real cost of war on civilian populations is, is, is happening, right? So with this, we're seeing um, many incidents um, that are being filmed, that are being distributed all around the world. Um, and with these powerful images that are coming out, uh, we're seeing that there's a lack of um, support um, by the general population in terms of um, the, the war in Vietnam. So there was a famous photograph called um, The Terror of War, which is also called Napalm Girl. I'm not sure if people have, have seen this image before. But this uh, image came out um, the first, it was the first image that um, uh, won a Pulitzer Prize, so an, 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 a very prominent um, uh, journalism prize, um, the year it was published, right? So in previous time, you know, these um, journalists were always winning these awards uh, at least like the, the next year or so, but this was the first time that this happened. And after this image was published, um, the next year, all Western countries uh, stopped supporting the war in Vietnam, right? So they all backed out, right? And so we can see that there's an enormous potential um, of, of images and of, of videos, right? Shortly after, all um, journalists, at least in the case of US and many other European countries, uh, had to be embedded within military troops, right? They couldn't go off and they couldn't do things on their own, right? And so you're seeing that conflicts, again, are being understood through this, like, very, um, for, through dominant power structures, right? Um, in 2011, starting with the Tunisian Revolution, as, as many of you know, um, we're seeing that this has changed. Right, so whereas conflicts in the past have been understood largely through uh, journalists or through governments, right, we're seeing the rise of citizen journalism, right, with um, emerging technology again, the lower cost of data, the widespread use of smartphones, um, the use of social media platforms, right, and we're seeing massive amounts of documentation that are happening, um, allowing for, for counter narratives to be constructed, right. So getting back to my work, um, in terms of Syria, we're seeing that Syria is the first um, major use case, we can call it, if we're coming from a tech perspective, where a conflict can be witnessed more or less by anyone in the world practically in real time, right? Um, now there's more hours of, of user-generated content, and what I mean by this is things that regular people are, are producing, right? Uh, uploading largely to social media platforms, right? So there's more hours of user-generated content about the conflict in Syria than there have been in the Syrian war itself, right? So more than nine years of documentation. Um, but there's a lot of challenges towards using this, and these are some of the things that my organization is trying to address. Um, the first is that a lot of the content is being removed. So when we started about six years ago, coming from privacy digital security scene, um, we were doing trainings with, with journalists, with lawyers, with activists, right, who at that time the borders were still open between Syria and, and neighboring countries. Um, and the people we were training were saying that even then a lot of the content was being removed from social media platforms, right? Um, so we started really as an emergency response um, to try to preserve this content and to store it somewhere else that's like offline, right, get it off of these, of these social media platforms. 
And the second ma uh, major challenge is that, okay, even if you verify this content, or even if you archive this content, right, you need to verify it because it's like a massive, massive amount of content. Um, and there's a lot of propaganda, there's a lot of misinformation, right? So you need to s have some way of kind of telling what's true and what's not, right? And the third major challenge is that it's unsearchable. So even if you have it, and even if you've verified it, um, you need to find some way of going through this content, right? And, and, and finding the things that you actually want to find. And so that's what we're trying to address. Um, so since uh, we started, we've archived um, about three and a half million pieces of content. So about 1.7 million videos from YouTube and also from Facebook and Twitter and some other places. Um, we verified a small number of this. Um, so I would say maybe uh, about 6,000 or so videos. So it's, it's, it's a really like a small percentage of the, of the total amount of content. Um, but we're working on using tech as a way of kind of um, triaging or, or, um, or, or finding um, pieces of content that are more relevant. So with this, we're partnering with a, with a project called VFrame, um, started with a, by, a, by, a, by a person named Adam Harvey, um, to use AI and uh, machine learning to detect and remove, uh, to detect um, uh, particular types of munitions, right? So here we're looking at um, cluster munitions, for example. Um, and we have a report that's going to be coming out in March or so, um, looking, looking at, at this type of content. Um, we also process this data, right? So even before we verify it, um, we've come up with a data ontology to be able to, um, um, like a metadata schema, basically, so that you can make this content searchable. Um, and then we use this type of content for um, open source investigations. Um, so, so these are things like, um, attacks on particular types of civilian infrastructure um, or, 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 or things like that, as well as creating new types of data sets. Um, so we did a report on, on um, uh, or database on chemical weapons attacks, right? And we're working right now on putting together and finalizing a database on attacks on hospitals and medical facilities. Um, so in terms of other ways that we're dealing with tech, um, as I said, a lot of this content is being removed. Um, we're seeing that um, platforms also are using um, machine learning and, and um, AI as a way of detecting and remove content that they deem as extremist. Um, so starting in 2017, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter um, started to use um, these tools to remove content. Uh, I think last year in Google's transparency report, they said YouTube removed about 8 million or so videos. Um, the majority of which, six million or so, were done through automated flagging, right, they called it. So this is content that's being removed before people, the general public, has seen it, right? So YouTube always says that there's a human review afterwards um, before something is removed. But we're seeing that a lot of this content is taken down before um, the general public sees it. Um, because we archive content, right, we have this unique identifier and we can see which types of content are being removed, right, and why. Right, because we have connections with a lot of the media houses and journalists who are in country. So this means that we're able to go back to platforms, right, like YouTube, like Facebook, and say, you know, certain types of content have been inadvertently removed, right, and trying to understand the real impact of these content moderation policies. Um, we're also part of uh, the Christchurch Call Advisory Network, which is now advising um, government of New Zealand and France in terms of the impacts of this content moderation policies. So I'm gonna stop here, because I know that I'm short on time, but I'm really looking forward to questions. Thanks so much. Thanks very much, Jeff. Um, so I would like to remind you that um, after uh, the talks, at the end of this session, there will be a, around 10 minutes uh, Q&A session, so uh, we will receive questions from the audience. So please note down your questions. Uh, and I would like to invite now uh, Sergei Boyko uh, to the stage. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Uh, I'm, I'm Sergei Boyko. I'm uh, from Russian Internet Protection Society. It's an uh, NGO. We are aiming at protecting Russian Internet from excessive government regulations and uh, censorship. And I have my own personal story about technology and activism. Uh, still, uh, it, it's personal, still yet practical, uh, and about surveillance. Mm. A year ago, I'm preparing a street uh, protest against the, our Russian pension reforms. So we are in France, I think it's uh, appropriate too. Uh, 
and uh, our local government decided to stop uh, that activity it, um, to prevent us uh, from organizing this event. So a week before the event, they decided to uh, take me uh, to police and uh, so I could not uh, publish the films and calling the people to action and so on. And uh, a week before the event, they, uh, the police came to me. I am living in condominium, so they came to the building entrance and waiting for me. Uh, then I out from the entrance, uh, they're asking, Sergey, hello, uh, could you please wait a minute? Uh, I say no and simply run. Uh, it was a big surprise for me that waiting uh, near the hundreds of kilograms, I'm running faster, still running faster than common Russian policemen. Uh, so um, I'm hiding, hiding in nearest building and start to think what to do next. Uh, that's why my uh, personal underground experience started. Uh, it's easy uh, to hide from the Russian police if you are not going to do anything. Uh, because you could eat, go to your uh, closest friend, eat, sleep, and do nothing on the internet. It's easier. Uh, but uh, I don't want to do nothing. I, do, I want to prepare the event. So I need to uh, live uh, underground, still active social life. Uh, the problems uh, I've met was first, uh, it's communication. Because every time I switched on my smartphone, I have only 10, maybe 15 minutes to drastically change my location. Because in Russia, uh, secret services, they have the opportunity to get uh, in real time your location from uh, mobile operators. And uh, of course, authorities uh, in uh, no time added a secret service in Russia, FSB, uh, to police uh, to search for me. And uh, in uh, FSB in Russia has uh, much authority other than internet and personal, personal information and data. And what's the problem for me? Uh, against that was the fact that according to public opinion, they could not get um, a court sentence, sentence against me. So they could not start a full federal search. Uh, they only uh, to dedicate to small task force to task to searching for me and fighting and getting to jail. Uh, it was easy. And uh, second uh, was my knowledge on how the thing uh, working in Russian internet and what's the limits of uh, possibility for FSB. Uh, so first task was communication. And as I could not use my smartphone completely and uh, public Wi-Fi is uh, it's not a, uh, a possibility too because in Russia then all, all the time then you are going to use public Wi-Fi you need to provide your phone number and get the SMS with code and provide that code so it's easy to find you uh, anyway. So I ask for my um, a friend, not the close friend because <laughs> they are starting surveillance on all my close friends and family and my office and so on uh, and uh, street surveillance and digital surveillance too. Uh, so I ask my not close friend to buy me uh, a new cheap smartphone and get in a SIM card and ask for him to meet in a place, then switch off my phone, meeting, take that smartphone so I could get the communication. Because uh, uh, still why I'm not using uh, my personal accounts uh, on uh, social networks and so on from that smartphone, it was, uh, uh, they couldn't get my allocation from that because I couldn't uh, know even IP or my mobile phone number. Uh, second one, I need to live somewhere. Uh, it was uh, in Russia in uh, autumn. Autumn, it's not a good uh, time to live on the street, so you need some uh, uh, more practical place. And uh, I couldn't go to my friends because uh, it, could, it couldn't danger them. Because if if they found me, they found my friend, it could be a problem for him to hide in me. Uh, so I need to find something, uh, something else. Uh, hotels uh, is not a variant too because all the Russian hotels, they are getting your passport and uh, informing the FSB about who staying where, here and why. Uh, so uh, I couldn't f f search on uh, uh, train, train stations and so on because uh, I, I couldn't go to the street because they're searching for me. So it was a simple answer, uh, it's about technology too. Uh, I could get a platform from Airbnb and it's still working. Uh, <laughs> it was good. Uh, third one, I need, uh, still I need to use social networks because uh, we are preparing an event. I need to call people to action, I need to write something in Facebook and uh, which was most important in contact, it's uh, similar as Facebook uh, social network uh, in Russia. And the uh, problem was that uh, all the Russian uh, internet companies, they're reporting to FSB in real time. So without even court decision, uh, FSB could get uh, all your information from your account uh, in real time. So if I'm 
even from my secret smartphone if I am accessing uh, my account directly uh, so they could find me in a moment. Uh, no, I'm not even using my, our organization, uh, organizational VPN because uh, we have a d direct server and if I access in the, my account from even that server, they could take the IP, go there and search who from our city goes there, uh, have surveillance on all internet traffic uh, in real time so they easily could find who can access in the server and still uh, find me. So I was into a public uh, and popular VPN so they couldn't find me for, for using that. Uh, and uh, it was a success. Uh, still, I made uh, one mistake uh, on third or maybe fourth day. Uh, I uh, could not uh, see that VPN connection is broken and still uh, went to uh, my account of contact. And uh, then I saw it. I decided to change the flat. Uh, it costs me two hours because I need to write some friend to, then I need to change the, uh, so he could get to me to take to uh, other flat. I need to get new one on Airbnb and so on because I could not use the public taxi services. Uh, still they are reporting uh, too. Uh, it, it, it cost me two hours and I am very uh, was very interesting, interested uh, in theory how it's working. Do they uh, search in uh, the social networks for me or not? So I asked uh, my other friend to uh, stay in, in the building and uh, watch. And yes, after half an hour, two hours for me to leave, and after half an hour, police car here. So uh, they are uh, monitoring constantly and searching. And um, first task, it was easy uh, to film in a video. I need a light and a camera, and they couldn't get it from my office because it was on constant surveillance. So I'm using Telegram to search for friends. It couldn't be public search, but I still could find uh, 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 camera and light and filming a video and uh, we uh, got the uh, very good event, uh, crowded and successful. So our uh, government uh, wasn't need to attach some uh, conditions of pension reform, so they are shifted our conditions. Uh, still I've got arrested and jailed, but on the event. Uh, it was, uh, I, I spent a month in jail for organizing such an event, but my uh, propers of hiding to organizing and to get to the event uh, myself, it was real. So all that um, statement, uh, all that government regulation and that uh, government burden on our budget and our company and users to regulate the internet, to surveil the internet, it's completely unaffected. For, for a week, I could use it actively. Uh, I could uh, I could hide and they could not find. So uh, that's why it's simply uh, not working. And you have only uh, have uh, two things. Uh, understanding of technologies and their limitations and uh, broad network of the friends. It's uh, hard to achieve in Russia because we have the biggest uh, police army in the world, but still achievable. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Sergey. So next, uh, we have Finn Sanders and Jan Niklas Nibisch from Fridays for Future Germany. So hello, I'm Finn from Fridays for Future Nuremberg. I'm Jan Niklas Nibisch from um, Fridays for Future Wilfrat. It's um, near Dusseldorf, and we are a very small gr local group um, with 20,000 um, people in um, our city, yes. Um. Okay, and uh, we'd like to talk about um, our use of social media and um, technology to communicate with each other and just organize the movement. And um, you maybe know Fridays for Future from the media, um, but what's maybe m more important to us is uh, social media to just get that many people on our strikes and um, maybe um, who needs further explanation what we do? Explanation what we do. Is there anyone? Okay, so Fridays for Future is uh, trying to um, leave the focus um, on the scientific results on the climate crisis. So we are striking and um, telling the government um, to do a better politic. Um, yes, um, with 
to deal with the climate cl crisis and um, that's what we are striking for and we are um, striking during our school time. So every Friday we uh, just leave the school um, to go to strike and um, to put the pressure on the government to do uh, a better climate politics. And um, to organize our strikes, it's very important to us to uh, use social media tools and um, like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. And um, yes, it's much easier to get many people on the streets using social media. And um, I personally made the experience that we try to, um, yes, mobilize people offline, for example, using flyers or um, or uh, transparency or something like that. And um, we just got almost no one on the street. So no one wanted our flyers. No one <laughs> just read what we, uh, what we wrote on the uh, transparency. And um, because we couldn't get the right people, we couldn't uh, draw the attention of the right people um, on our goals. And um, Yes, so we are using social media, like for example Instagram. Instagram is our most important um, social media tool um, to get people on the streets because many young, peoples are many young people are using Instagram and um, people who are interested just um, see what we want them to see. <laughs> so <laughs> um, for example, we have social media groups in almost every local group and um, they are um, almost not more than three to four people. Uh, for example, in Nuremberg, we have um, about four people who do social media regularly and uh, who are doing posts for our social media and writing texts. And with these four people, we managed to get 10,000 people on the streets on uh, the 20th of September. Um, and so it's a very effective way to um, get people to get um, people on the streets. And um, that's why social media is so important to us because we need very, uh, very few work, very less, uh, not that much people, um, to, to spread our message. And um, that's why we use social media that much and that's why social media is so important to us. But we also have um, to communicate with each other because Fridays for Future Germany is, um, yes, we are organized all over the country and um, that's something Yannick Lask will tell you more about. Yes, um, <coughs> at uh, very local, every local group we have um, WhatsApp um, chats with each other and the problem is WhatsApp is not so secure as um, any messenger, um, but if we want to engage the m as, as most people as we um, get, we have to use the common, lang uh, common messenger and this is WhatsApp. On the federal level, we um, use other tools like uh, our own pads. Um, you can write there um, information down and um, paste links to other um, tools from us. And um, we have there uh, s for sch schedule um, our meetings um, ev once a week. We are um, t we are t uh, telecommunicate um, each with each other on the federal level. Um, to um, plan the next um, big strike. It's a, um, we have some strikes that are national or strikes that are um, worldwide and that have to be um, communicated very well. And to, to do this, um, we have to um, call each other and we um, use tools like Zoom. Um, does anybody know what Zoom is? Yes, uh, very good. Um, and <laughs> And then um, we are telling, uh, calling um, about three hours and are discussing very uh, much things um, and it's very time um, wasting. Mm -hmm. But um, we have to um, make this to um, communicate with Arjo. Okay. okay, what I forgot to say in the beginning, if you have any questions, if anything is unclear, just feel free to raise your hand and uh, we'll try to explain. Um, okay, and um, what is also important to us is to um, just get information or further information except from social media like Instagram or Twitter, which is very passive. Um, 
to the people, so we need a tool to discuss with the people. So if anyone has questions, um, he needs to ask us. If um, anyone who wants uh, to go to... Actually, we will have a, a Q&A Q &A session uh, just after you finish your talk. Okay. Uh, so but, uh, would you like to add uh, something more before we move to the Q&A session? Um, yes, I, uh, I'm going on. Yeah, okay, cool. Okay, um, so it's very important to us to have um, something to communicate directly with um, the people who are willing to, to strike with us. And so we have our WhatsApp groups and um, Telegram groups and Discord groups um, so that everyone um, can communicate with us and everyone has um, the possibility to influence, for example, our goals. Or, um, and um, so one of our main problems is that, they are that our um, chats are public. But we need to have our chats public because everyone needs to have access. But as you maybe can mention, there are many people who are not happy with Fridays for Future and um, who are very contra. <laughs> and um, so they try to enter our chats and um, start spamming, start uh, writing illegal stuff. And so we have a group of about uh, 30 people in Germany who is um, controlling the groups we are called chat etiquette and we are both from the chat etiquette in germany and um, we are making rules for the chats um, but we are also administrating our chats so that we uh, just can ban the people who are violating our rules um, and we have we have um, actually many problems with um, people who are from the very right wing for example um, and who are using, for example, uh, illegal symbols. And um, that's also one of the reasons why we are um, working together with the police, because um, some people are writing very seriously illegal stuff. And um, one of our problems is that um, we have many very young children in these groups, uh, like m some of them are not 10, are not even 10. And um, so we need to, to just take care. Um, but with tools like WhatsApp, you may imagine it's not that easy because you can't just uh, filter content before it gets online. And um, yes, so we have, we have to work with the police together to uh, just get these people out of our groups. But um, the police has, even the police has problems or is not willing to help us because they think um, our issues are too small to be uh, interesting for the police or to be to be judged, and um, yes, that's that's one of our major major problems we are working on, and um, it's very time intensive to just um, yeah, it's get um, to just figure these problems. Okay, uh, I think we are, we are already done. done. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> so now I would like to invite uh, Jeff and Sergey back to the uh, stage um, so we can have the, uh, well, approximately 10 minutes uh, Q&A session with the audience. So um, you can ask questions uh, for uh, all of them. Um, Joe, uh, maybe I can take it. Thank you. Um, great selection of speakers. Uh, well done. Um, I'm really interested in the Syrian archive, um, particularly around transparency from the social media companies. So looking at the Google, for example, transparency report do you can a can a normal human being get any insight into your problems looking at the transparency report first question <laughs> general question specifically how many of your videos have been removed by YouTube and thirdly have you has YouTube ever said that anything you've uploaded is illegal okay um, 
So three questions. The first was, can a normal human being make sense of a transparency report? Is that, is, okay. Um, I think the transparency report is good because it shows you the scale at which these kinds of issues are happening, but it won't tell you the types of content that's being removed, right? Um, Facebook, I think, in terms of their content moderation, they talk about uh, content being removed specifically in terms of terrorism, right? So this is like a, a definition that they're using, right? Uh, but these definitions are, of course, not universal, right? They're US-based companies. They're often relying on US-based uh, definitions um, and using US um, um, terrorist groups, right? So groups that are on US terrorism list. Um, so yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't know that you can get a whole lot out of it except for understanding the scale and the ways in which these companies are viewing this. Um, the second question was um, uh, um, um, number of videos removed um, uh, from, from our collection, you mean? Yeah, um, I would say um, it comes and goes, right? Um, many of the videos that we've seen removed, we've spoken to platforms, um, for example, and had them reinstated. Um, but a lot of these videos are removed again, right? Um, so there's been maybe 400,000 videos that we have that have been removed. Um, I would say we've worked on reinstating about 300,000 or so. Uh, most of these um, have been removed again, right? So sometimes from the same sources, the same videos are being removed multiple times. Um, and because we're in contact with many of the, the media houses, right, they're also sending us the reasons why this content is being taken down. Uh, so we, we, we have like a history of, 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 of some of these reasons. And the third question, I don't... Um, I, I, I mean, I, I'm, I don't know the relationship between um, um, police and, and, and these companies. I do know that, I mean, we're working in multiple jurisdictions, right? So it's not only US, it's not only Germany, it's not only, you know, um, Syria, right? Um, we're also, I mean, we're, we're doing documentation also in Yemen uh, and, and Sudan and some other places. Um, but in places like Myanmar, right, where you're having content that's taken down for very different reasons, um, um, I mean, Germany, we are seeing that some of this content um, has been used in the investigation of um, people returning fighters, right? So people who had gone to Syria had documentation of them doing um, certain types of violations, whether this is terrorism or not, and then tried back in Germany. Also in Sweden, there's been a couple of cases. Um, um, I, 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 think it, I think it depends on if you're talking about local policing or if you're talking about things like uh, international war crimes um, investigations. But, but I'm, yeah. Do we have content that allegedly is terrorist related, is your, is your asking? Yeah, no, of course. I mean, um, um, I mean, if you're looking at the, a lot of the footage is not just people filming um, crime-based, right? So the aftermath of, let's say, an, an, an attack or an incident, right? But some of it is also like perpetrator-based, right? So you'll see that um, content is being filmed and uploaded by um, um, uh, opposition groups or, or other, or, 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 or um, you know, quote unquote terrorist organizations, right? I mean, just bec uh, this content can also be useful because you can find things in it that you can at some point potentially use for different types of investigations, right? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so next, Ivan, uh, would you like to come here to ask you a question? Everybody can join. Thank you. I'm Ivan Seiket from the Central European University and the Open Society Archive. <coughs> I have a question to Sergey, and I have a serious warning to the activist society. <coughs> Let me uh, start with the second one. Uh, the, um, the example of the Syrian archive is <coughs> an exceptional example an exceptionally good example. But unfortunately, the rest, more or less the rest of the activist society uh, don't care for properly archiving their activities. So my warning or advice is please don't trust the cloud, don't trust the social media platforms. They are very convenient, very convenient for distributing information, but it's not good for archiving. I know that most of you are interested in the present in today and maybe in tomorrow and you are not interested in yesterday. But it's very important to prove that 
your existence is there, and for many reasons. So uh, the, uh, the uh, suggestion is please contact, if I may say, the Syrian archives, or even my archive, which is also a very significant human rights archive, and take some care of archiving your work. But now the question to Sergei. Don't you think that if you talk openly uh, about your techniques, how to circumvent the investigation by the FSB, don't you think that, and it will be also filmed and uploaded to the internet, then you help the FSB to close the gaps in their techniques to, to find activists like you? Um, most of the time is question, uh, then you are speaking about it, uh, much people using uh, the technologies. And uh, in uh, our work in Russia, I think that society is adapting uh, quicker than uh, FSB, so uh, it's better to speak than not to. Okay, thank you. So that's, uh, that's an optimistic <laughs> note. <laughs> Good question. Thank you very much, Ivan. Uh, for the questions, uh, Thank you. Another question for Jeff. I was wondering who uses your, your data and how do you make sure that it's admissible for um, criteria, criteria when it comes to evidence admissibility, especially in war crime, um, and whether it's actually used and, and receivable in, in sure. this context? Yeah. Um, so, so, so the question is, what, what kinds of things do we do to um, make it more likely to be used as evidence, right? Um, and also, who's using it? So, first, who's using it? Um, there's a lot of journalists who are using it. Uh, lots of human rights groups, like Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, especially um, their D Digital Verification Corps, which is an amazing, amazing program. Um, we are also using some of this content for some cases uh, in, in a couple of different places. Um, actually, we did one investigation that was a different type of open source investigation uh, using data, right? So not videos, not photos, right, but data. Um, last year, um, uh, this investigation was looking at um, Belgian companies that had shipped um, uh, chemicals to Syria, right, in violation of EU sanctions, right? Um, so this is also open source content. This story actually resulted in the conviction of three companies um, in, in Belgium, um, and, and similar cases being initiated in other places, right? Um, what kinds of things are we doing to preserve or to ensure that the content is potentially legally ad admissible? Uh, we're, we're hashing, we're timestamping all of the content, um, and we're having this stored with an independent like third party, so based remotely, right? So that at least there's a copy of these hashes um, that shows that the content um, isn't tampered with after we've gotten it, right? So you can always cross-reference these, these things against each other. Um, and we also, through creating a criteria or a metadata schema, um, have come up with categories working with um, archival groups, right? Working with lawyers um, to try to make it useful. Um, so things like using um, United Nations OHCHR definitions, right, or criteria, um, but also things like um, trying to uh, come up with things like intent, right, so ways of trying to um, 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 uh, judge intent from, from a variety of, of data collections. So does that kind of answer the question a little bit? Or okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So we'll have the last few questions, uh, and uh, we need to move to the next session. Uh, I think you you would like to? Um, hi. Uh, not much of a question, but I uh, wanted to advertise what my organization can do for activists. We're called Frontline Defenders, and we're an organization that uh, provides activists with training on digital and communication security, personal security, organizational security, and grants if you're attacked because of your work and you're at risk. So lawyers' fees, medical fees, temporary relocation. Um, so I just wanted to use this opportunity being in this space to say that if any of you are human rights activists, even if the wider sense, climate activists, really in the widest possible definition of human rights, um, and we can help you, please do contact us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, please. Um, Andres, can you com come here, correct? Okay, and uh, okay. Well, 
first we'll take the question of Andres and then the next question. Hi, just a quick question to Sergey, that it was like um, on my head. Is um, during this time that you were like in the hiring and all of that, how did you manage to get things paid? For example, the Airbnb and all of that. Did you rely on traditional financial services to pay for them or did you use technology like cryptocurrencies such as Monero, Zcash, and all of that? Or how did you do it? Because yeah. I, I mean, I believe that the FSB as well as monitoring the social network and all of that, they are monitoring the, tradition, uh, the traditional financial system. I would like to take the last question as well. Uh, hello. Sorry, uh, I don't have a question. Um, I have also a commentary, especially for Fridays for Future. Thanks very much for all your great activism. I'm very behind what you do. I'm a little bit concerned that you rely so much on these uh, public I tools. Is the mic microphone on? Is it okay. Sorry, is it too quiet? I w will you speak up a bit? Please I'm a little bit concerned. Um, that you use relying so heavily on these public tools for such a large amount of people. Um, I wonder if you've seen the talk at the um, um, what's it Com Chaos Computer Congress in Leipzig. There was a talk f uh, by the sysadmin of the um, Extinction Rebellion. It's a video available at uh, media.ccc.de. I recommend any activist to, to watch it because he's found solutions to a lot of the networking problems that you might have to reach all the individuals. Thank you very much. And then the very last uh, question or comment. Yes. Okay. Um, hi, thanks. Uh, Fridays for Future, brilliant. Thanks for all your work on behalf of all of us and all my kids as well. Um, question on the platform's use. Have you had any problems with the age of users, given that WhatsApp is meant to be for 16 and up? Um, and have you actually had the platforms themselves pose you any problems? And have you thought about how you address that? Thank you very much. Um, okay, so uh, we first start with Sergey and then uh, we move to Fridays for Future. Uh, okay, uh, about finances. Uh, it's a very good question because there could uh, at no time uh, close your bank account accounts and uh, cards. So uh, in my case, they're not doing it this uh, for first two days. So I could simply go to ATM and withdraw the cash and using the cash already. But for uh, for if you need long longer time, it's, it's a problem, yeah. And now then, uh, for example, um, two months ago, uh, they're closing the uh, account of our account of our organization. It was a problem they were there to get the money because they took all the cash from my uh, from my flat uh, doing the search there and all the uh, blocking accounts. So it's, it's a problem still. And we have in Russia, uh, it's a pity, but we have no infrastructure for uh, Monero and so on. So you could not, uh, uh, you could transfer, but uh, then you need to buy something. And one more, uh, pl please, uh, one more comment for Ivan. Uh, it's uh, about speaking or, or not. I is it good or, or not? I have a, a very good example. For example, uh, many of you, I, I'm sure, uh, knowing about two-factor aut uh, authentication. And uh, in Russia, using, for example, second factor as your SMS with code, it's completely... Uh, um, uh, um it's not good because uh, all the time a secret services they could call your mobile operator and ask uh, for it. I'm, I, they done it uh, for me in those weeks uh, and ask for sending SMS not to your phone but to their phones. And they're simply uh, go, going to platform and stating, uh, I forgot my password, give me an SMS and taking the code and use it. And you are even don't know about that. So most of the time I need to use a Google Authenticator or so, so tools. And if we are not speaking about it, uh, the uh, people no, know it about, uh, don't know about the problem and using their wrong methods. If you are speaking, uh, it's better for them. Thank you very much. Um, yes, Finan, Jan, Niklas, can you, uh, yes. Okay, first of all, thank you for your comment. Um, I think we can maybe just talk to each other later on. <laughs> and um, to your question, we had luckily never a problem that users um, in our groups were banned due to age by the platforms, but we are very concerned, uh, for example, if people just send uh, pornography, etc., in these groups that uh, young children can see it, and um, that's a big problem to us, and we are concerned about it. I think, I hope I've answered your question. 
Uh, yes, I guess so. And would you like to say uh, something as well about? Okay. Well, uh, probably there are further questions. Uh, we, but we need to move to the uh, next session. So I suggest that uh, the uh, uh, the conversation can go on further in the networking space. Thank you very much to all of you for joining us and for telling us your stories. Uh, and now here, uh, the next session here is, uh, I think, uh, defending the digital space. Yes, okay, great, thank you very much. Uh, the next, and um, there will be uh, another session uh, in uh, room, bo uh, room Bob, uh, yeah, which is at the end of the uh, hall here. Thank you.